in the middle of that song. Thank you, Lord. The question that I'm asked more than any other is, how do you know when you hear from God? How can you be sure of what he's saying? And that's why this morning we come to one verse. And my goal is to make it simple without being trite. Because hearing from God is not that difficult. Turn with me in your Bibles to the great chapter of Romans chapter 8. In the New Testament, just after the Gospels, you've got uh, Acts and then the book of Romans. Chapter 8, right in the middle of the book, and verse 16. One verse this morning. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. Now this one verse answers the question, how is it that God is able to speak to us? And how is it that we're able to hear from him? And who is it that he generally speaks to? And and what kind of thing can we expect him to talk with us about? It's all here in this one verse. The first issue of how is it that God speaks? It says the Spirit himself. Now we know that God is Spirit, but we also know that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. That he's three persons in one God. But it says here that when the one God speaks, normally he speaks by the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, you might have always thought of the Holy Spirit as kind of the energy field around the Father and the Son. Uh, kind of like um, Star Wars, the Force be with you. Yeah. He's the Force of, of the Godhead. Well, not so fast, and I want to get a little technical, but I promise I'm not going to lose you. Put the two words together, Spirit and Himself. I want to just give you a little Greek grammar lesson here. Every noun in the Greek language is is gender specific it's either masculine feminine or neuter if it's masculine the pronoun that would go with it would be he or himself if it's female it would be she or herself if it's neuter it would be it or itself now the noun spirit in the greek language is neuter so normally the pronoun that would be next to it would be it or itself. Notice that's not what it says here, and it's no mistake. It's very specific. This is one of the many reasons why I believe that every word in the Bible is is intended perfectly and specifically. So it says the spirit, which is a neuter noun, himself. Don't miss it. Himself. It's, It's categorically in the masculine. And the reason is because the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not impersonal. The Holy Spirit is as personal as God the Father and God the Son. And God wants you to understand that. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you're not getting just a vibe. You are hearing the words from the person of God, God the Holy Spirit. He's speaking himself. Now, God speaks, and we're going to see the seven primary ways that God speaks. We're going to look at them this morning. But whenever he speaks, however he speaks, he always speaks by the Spirit. That's why this verse clearly identifies this reality. And it's so important to understand that. That's why to every one of the uh, churches in the book of the Revelation, and there are seven of them listed in the book of the Revelation, the last book in the Bible. They were seven local churches uh, that formed kind of a semicircle, and itinerant preachers would would travel to these churches, and the trade route, uh, the hucksters that would take their wares from out of town, uh, imports into the country, would follow the same route. It was these seven specific churches, to every one of them, God had a specific message, and he confronted all seven of the churches. But to every church, he, had, he said one thing that was identical, and this is it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, isn't that interesting? There it is again. 
What does the church listen to when they listen to God? Well, sure, it's God the Father, because God the Father is the one who speaks. And the word that comes from the Father is the Son. He's the word. But to make that word known to us, it's the work of the Holy Spirit, always. That's why we answer the first question, how is it that God is able to speak to us? He speaks to us by his Spirit. Now, how is it that we're able to hear him when he speaks? We're able to hear him. Now listen carefully. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit. So how is it we're able to hear him? We're able to hear God in our spirit. Okay, now to unpack that a little bit, the Bible says that we are spirit, soul, and body at our core. At our essence, we are spiritual beings. Around that is a soul, and around that is a body. People ask all the time, does God speak audibly? Well, the answer is, yes, he can, but not normally. Where do you get that in the Bible? Right here. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit. Now, notice it doesn't say soul. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions. People say, well, do you feel God? Do you feel something when he's speaking to you? That's not the right question. Because feelings, in terms of feelings being emotions, are soulish. God speaks deeper than the soul. He speaks to the spirit. And until we we trust our spirit to be able to hear from God, we probably won't. Mm -hmm. But this is where God speaks. He speaks deeper than the body, Deeper than the soul, God speaks to the Spirit. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit. Now we've got listed here in your notes, and I think you'll enjoy this, the seven primary ways that we hear God. Number one is through the Bible. Thank God that this is the Word of God. Now the the Bible itself calls itself the sword of the Okay, let's say that together. The sword of the spirit. Now, notice, this is is a written book, but it's the sword of the spirit. The spirit himself takes the word, the written word, to speak to our spirit. So deeper than just studying this intellectually, objectively, which is all fair game, while we're studying this and reading it objectively and consistently, God wants us to develop an ear so that while we're reading, we can hear what the Spirit is saying to us. So the primary way, and the, the, the first of the seven is the Word of God, the Bible itself. The second is the prophetic word of knowledge or word of wisdom. These are listed in the nine manifestation gifts listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But God often will use these two specific spiritual gifts, the prophetic word of knowledge and the prophetic word of wisdom, to speak to us. We'll come back to that one. The third is through dreams and visions. God does speak through dreams. We're going to talk a little bit about this so that we can... Uh, understand when to trust them and when not to. But how many of you would say, in my life, there was, I I know of at least one time that I'm confident that God spoke to me through a dream. How many of you would say that? That's quite amazing. I, I would seriously love to sit here and listen to every story. I would love to hear how God spoke to you through dreams, but we're gonna come back to that one. And then visions. Vi- uh, dreams are when you're sleeping. Visions are when you're awake. Now, sometimes the visions are very vivid, like watching a movie or something. Sometimes they're more subtle, like when you're praying. You, you may not get a full, like, HD yeah. movie, but you might just get a picture. Yeah. You're praying over someone. Now, I have learned to trust those pictures. Yeah. Just like when you pray, Thoughts will come into your mind on what to pray. So you pray those things. Well, 
trust the fact that God will give you not only words when you're praying, but he'll give you pictures. And I have found a lot more firepower when praying in ministry prayer situations, like when people come to the front for prayer afterwards, to pray the picture before I pray the thought. When I pray the picture, often people will start trembling. Uh, Their chin might start quivering, or tears might come. It's because a picture goes deeper than the mind, it goes into the spirit. And pictures are worth a thousand. So in one picture that God gives, He can speak tremendously through pictures. But we'll come back to that. Then the fourth is circumstances. God definitely speaks through circumstances. The the, the caveat here is that circumstances are reality. But often you will get a word from God that takes you to a higher reality. We'll come back to that one. <clears throat> then the sixth one are angels. Uh, there's no question if you want to teach how to hear from God from the Bible, you've got to include angels because I- emphatically, uh, frequently, God speaks to his people uh, through angels. If we have time, we'll come back to that one. And then the last on the list, but not least, are people. God does use people to speak to us. I like to put it this way, however. God calls people confirm. God calls people confirm. Rarely will God give you a word like the first time you hear it from a person. In fact, if you get a word from God from a person, that is like out of left field, you've never had that thought before, you ought to seriously question whether that was from God. If, on the other hand, that, like, God's been talking to you that, you've been talking with your spouse about it, and then you get someone else, that's called confirmation. People confirm, but you don't want to go out on a limb on a word from a person. You want to weigh that carefully because God will speak normally through that internal voice. We doing okay? So how does he do it? He testifies to our spirit. And he uses these seven different ways to testify to our spirit. Okay. Now, who does he normally talk to? And the answer is the children of God. The born-again believers. Now, can he speak to unbelievers? Of course he can. God can speak to anyone. And he does speak to unbelievers. But that's the exception. The rule is God wants to speak continually to you from the moment you're born again. From the moment you trust Christ as your Savior and your spirit is reborn inside you, that spirit now that's been reborn, that's where God will speak to you, in your reborn spirit as a child of God. That's what it says. He testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. Now what is it, this is the last question, so what is it that we can expect God to normally talk with us about? And I love this part. And, And this is a new revelation for me. I've been living it, but I've never taught this before. And I think I'm right. 95% of the time when God talks to you, here's the kind of things he says. I love you. You belong to me. You are my child. I've got this one. You don't have anything to worry about. You're all mine. I've taken responsibility for you. I will provide for you. You can trust me. Now, doesn't that sound like God? 
I am not putting words in God's mouth. Those are the kind of things. Now, how do we know that? Because of this verse. Just look at the verse again. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit. Okay, now, testifies. I, I like that word. It doesn't just say he speaks or he nudges or he suggests. People, we have so many voices in our heads. We have so many voices in our world clamoring for our attention that when God speaks, he testifies. He tells the truth. We've got all kinds of voices that that confuse the issue, that tell us lies. Oh, you better really worry about this one. Oh, your life's out of control. Oh, there's no hope for you. We got all those voices. That's not the voice of God, because that's not testifying. When God testifies, he says, I don't care what else you're listening to. I'm telling you, you're my child. I've got this one, and I love you. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the voice of God. You're my child. What does that mean? You're my child. Now look at the verse before it. Verse 15, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery that makes you fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now that's really where verse 16 begins. When we cry, Abba, Father, that is the Spirit himself testifying with our spirit that we are children of God. So what's God saying? You're my child. Oh, I'm your child. Daddy, father. So our saying, daddy, father, is our response to his word, to our spirit, that we are his children. It's what it says. No, 95% of the things God says to us is not what car to buy, where to move, what stocks to sell in a hurry, what stocks to invest in to to earn a a lot. You know, that's where we want to hear God all the time. But 95% of the time, and God will will do that at times if he wants to. But what he's committed to is to speak these kinds of things to our hearts. You're my boy. You're going to make it. I've given you a new nature. Don't settle for less than your inheritance. Now, we've looked at the verse before. Now go to the verse after. Verse 17. It says here, If children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So what is that saying? What it's saying is when the Spirit testifies to us that we are his child, he he adds to that that we're we're heirs of God. That means that whatever God's got in the house belongs to us. That's what he says to us. And not only heirs of God, if if we don't get it completely, here's here's the real punchline, and co-heirs with Christ. That means if Jesus has got it, it's ours too. So, I'm protected because I'm in Christ, and and in Christ, I'm as protected as Christ. And I'm accepted and loved because I'm in Christ, and in Christ, I'm loved as Christ. I'm a co-heir with Christ. Our union in Christ is what the Spirit talks to me about. And my inheritance and all that is mine because I am His. Oh! Are you getting this? Come on, somebody's got to admit that's good stuff. Please. Somebody tell me that's good. We need this. When we go through the storms, we need this. In fact, look at what it says. Co-heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him 
in order that we may also be glorified with him. Three times there's with. With Christ, with him suffering, and with him glorified. Oh. Because we're in him. We're with him. You know, there are times, and this is, let's come back to that seventh way that God speaks uh, through people. Or, or the, the, the one on the list there, the fourth one, the one right in the middle, through circumstances. There are circumstances that will make you think God is not with you. That's where, and listen carefully, if you are going to hear from God through circumstances, you have got to recognize God is with you in the circumstances. If you don't see God with you in the circumstances, whatever you do, don't allow yourself to think you're hearing from God through the circumstances. you, you got to admit that that makes sense. How can God speak to you in it if, if you don't feel like he's with you in it? One of the next verses, we're in Romans 8, 16. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know, we're confident of this one thing, that in everything, God works together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, I'm going to ask you another question, and I'd like a, sh- a response. How many of you, sometime this past year, faced a circumstance that left you anxious or fearful? Okay. Now, I can, I can tell you part of what that was is the circumstance loomed bigger than your God. Don't listen to the circumstances. If your circumstances seem bigger than your God, don't listen. Bring your circumstance to your God and recognize the presence of God in your circumstance, and then God will speak to you. When you, the only way to really understand that in everything, in everything, God works for good is to seek that God is with me in the circumstance and then he's working for good. And in all of that is is where God's speaking, saying, I am here. I know the circumstance is terrible, but I'm with you in it. I want to make my presence known to you in the middle of it. Now, with all of that, I want to come back to the seven ways that God speaks and just illustrate them a little bit for us. The first one, in our Bible reading. I hope you all make it a habit of each day opening the Word, not to be religious, but to listen. To listen to the voice of God. I had a dear professor in graduate school, J. Christy Wilson, taught missions. Um, He was the head of the missions department at my graduate school. And he was born in Iran, spent 22 uh, years serving in uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And after 22 years, he's reading Deuteronomy chapter 1, where it says, don't walk around this mountain anymore. And then before he's done with the chapter, it says it again. Don't, I, I told you, don't walk around this mountain anymore. No, there's mountains all over that region. And, but this time he took it personally. And while he's reading this and thinking about it in his mind, the spirit is saying to his spirit, you need to move today, now. Get your wife, get your children, get out of Dodge. And he did. And later that day, the place where they were living was completely blown up. And the nation uh, totally switched the balance of powers. No, that's God. You see, he wasn't just reading the Bible as a religious exercise. He was listening way beneath the surface. Now, normally you would not take a word like that and apply it to your life like that. But on that day, God spoke to his spirit and gave him a warning. And it wasn't a fear-dripping warning. It was a courage imparting warning that moved him to action and saved his life and his wife and his children. That's how to listen and hear God even in the middle of our Bible reading. 
the prophetic word. Prophetic word of knowledge, word of wisdom. There are so many times when I'm driving down 285 and I'm about to change lanes. I've checked my mirrors and everything's cool and I'm about to change lanes and in my spirit, I feel this like, uh, uh, not really a good idea. And so I hold my lane and all of a sudden, um, meow. That has happened to me at least a dozen times. Now every one of those, I could have been dead. The other guy would have been dead. It would have been a disaster. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've had that in my spirit. Better pray for the pastor's driving more often. <laughs> now, follow this. When we say that God speaks primarily to his children, I think we understand that. It's not the only way, but uh, God speaks to everyone, but, but primarily and consistently he speaks to his children. But it's not just haphazard. God speaks to those who listen and obey. God speaks to the best listeners. God speaks most when we seek him wholeheartedly. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And so it's, it's most often in the act of seeking God that we will hear God. And I want to encourage us all to uh, use a journal and to engage in what I've come to know as prophetic journaling. It's when you're writing down things you've heard from God and all of a sudden God starts speaking fresh. Now when I journal in my, in my journal, I just write. If there's scriptures, I try to circle them. But when there's a, a word, a prophetic word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, I always put an arrow in the margin and then I start writing. Sometimes I've written two or three pages at a time. Sometimes it's one phrase. But then it's often those things that I go back to that are so life-giving. It's just, it's a way of actively listening. It's called prophetic journaling. But to listen with an, a way of documenting those things that God has said. Dreams, we've talked a little bit about those. I just want to say there's two types of dreams. There's dreams that are projection, and there's dreams that are revelation. And they could not be further apart. A dream that is a projection is a projection of things you've been thinking about and you dream them, and they are not words from God. They are projections. On the other hand, there are dreams that are revelation, that they come from God, that rather than being projected from things that are deep within us, they're being revealed to us. That is a word from God. And that dream normally will leave you a little trembling, not with fear, but of awe. You know the difference? Fear is when you tremble because you're in the presence of evil. Awe is when you tremble and in you, you're in the presence of good. A dream from God will never produce fear of evil because God doesn't give the spirit of fear. So often people will call me on the phone, Pastor, I had this terrible dream last night. I said, were you afraid? I sa uh, they said, yes. Oh, well, it was not from God. How do you know that? Because God doesn't do it that way. Oh, I wish I knew that later. I would have gotten some sleep last night. <laughs> people, we don't have to make this difficult. This is not confusing. No one in the Bible that had a dream from God wondered, was this from God? They knew it was from God. There's a clarity, there's a cleanness, there's a freedom, there's a holiness, there's a boldness. And there may be a warning, but it's not with a spirit of fear. This is not difficult. This matter of projection is a real concern of mine. 
I've, I have avoided teaching on this subject for a long time for fear of opening up Pandora's box, so to speak, and having all kinds of people thinking that they've got a word from God, but it was really a projection of their own thoughts. I want to say that's the definition of a false prophet. When you project on God something that's from you and call it from God, that's a false prophet. But there is such a categorical difference. We don't have to put words in God's mouth. But when we get a word from God's mouth, it'll change your life. It changes everything. And getting a word from God is not a sporadic occurrence. This is a daily occurrence. Every day, God is speaking. Are you listening? Are you enjoying? Are you receiving? If there are thoughts that go through your mind of condemnation, they are not from God. Just rule them out. If they're fear-inducing, depression-inducing, get rid of them. They're not from God. Revelation from God is... Yes, it's, it brings us to our knees. Yes, we tremble, but we don't go running. We tremble and want more. We, we're exposed for who we are, and we love it. We're more ourselves when we get a revelation from God than any other time. It's not delusional. This is biblical. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit. That we are children of God. We are blessed. We are loved. We are cared for. We are protected. We belong. Thank you, Master Treat yourselves to hearing from God. In fact, you know what I feel right now? I feel like many of you are saying, wow, I've been hearing from God, and I didn't even know it. I've heard those things. He's told me those things, but I didn't know that was God. Now you do. <laughs> Praise him. Don't get, don't get cocky over it. But, but he's your glory. He's the lifter of your head. There is a, a joy and a freedom and an enjoyment of a word from God. His words are healing. Amen. They're life-giving. And he, he speaks continually. He's the best conversationalist ever. Oh, there's so much more. But we're going to leave it right there. One verse. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are children of God. Hallelujah. Let's stand together, church. There's something <clears throat> in me that right now and in, while preparing this week, standing in this room, walking around, praying over every seat in this room, that I felt like this was the thing to do, and so I'm going to do it. We often don't. But I want to ask you, church, I want to ask you, if you know you're a child of God, or you want to know that you're a child of God, and you want to hear the Spirit testify to your spirit more frequently, more consistently, I want to ask you to slip out from where you're standing. I want, you to, I want to ask you to come on down here. Why? You know this. You know that the front isn't more holy than the back. But there's something about saying, yes, Lord, I want this. I want you to stir up hearing in my life. I want to welcome your voice. And I want to come under your voice. And Lord, I, I want to do what you tell me. 
This is, you all come. Others keep coming. I want to read this from dear Oswald Chambers, from my utmost for his highest. Back in February, I read this. We show how little we love God by preferring to listen to his servants only. We like to listen to personal testimonies, but we do not desire that God himself should speak to us. Why are we so terrified lest God should speak to us? Because we know that if God does speak, either the thing must be done or we must tell God that we will not obey him. Others, keep coming. Say yes, Lord. I want to hear, Lord. I want you to open my ears. I want you to stir up and activate my hearing. I want to get younger, Lord. You see, this has everything to do with becoming younger because when the Father tells you you're his child, he's renewing your youth. When the Father tells you he's your father... It's your identity. All those issues of youth are being restored when we learn to hear his voice. And when we linger in his presence to hear him say those tender things. No, if you're younger, I invite you to come. If you're older, I invite you to come. None of us need to be suffering from spiritual hearing loss. Just hold your hands out to the Lord as we sing and worship him this morning. Just hold this moment.